Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at www.veritas.org. The following material is copyrighted and may not be duplicated, reproduced, or redistributed without prior written consent from the Veritas Forum. Join us as we explore true life. Picking, but uh, it's something that I've been dealing with. Um, I just wanted your take on um, the differences between like um, the Gospels in certain aspects. Uh, my example would be the different four different uh, Gospels and their takes on the angel. One says the young man, one says two, one says two sitting down. Like the different ones. What's your take on each Gospel having slight takes on that, and how does that fit in with the Bible being written by God? Well, I'm not defending the view that the Bible is written by God. And I think that's absolutely critical to understand this. When a historian approaches his documents, he, he doesn't expect them to be inerrant in order to be fundamentally reliable. And so I was very careful in the way I stated those four facts with respect to the resurrection, that um, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers on the Sunday morning following his crucifixion. But I'm not claiming that the Gospels are reliable with respect to the number of angels at the tomb or even that there was an angel at the tomb or, or other details of the narratives. What I am defending and what most scholars are united on is the historical core of the narrative, which is stated in the four facts as I presented them. And that's consistent with saying that the secondary details differ, may be in conflict, uh, you could even say that there are uh, legendary traces in the secondary details. But what would be uh, excluded from that is to say that the historical core of the narrative is unreliable. I think that we have here a good reason for thinking that in its core, this, these four facts have been established. The point that you're raising about dealing with the details, the secondary circumstances of the narrative, is really a question for theology. This would be a debate among Christians, I think, as to what a doctrine of inspiration commits you to. Uh, if you regard the Gospels as inspired by God, does this commit you to their inerrancy and all these sorts of details? And I, I think that's an in-house debate that we Christians need to have, but isn't germane to the question tonight about who was Jesus. Yes. I would like to play devil's advocate for a moment on behalf of those who might be new to the field of apologetics. Uh, a skeptic would probably respond to your presentation first by saying, I am so convinced of natural causes being universally explaining all phenomena. Uh, I'm a naturalist. I think that is so well established by science that the progress of science seems to steadily be explaining more and more, and I think it's pretty obvious, again, I don't believe this, but it's pretty obvious that science will one day explain everything, or at least it could if we were smart enough to, to do enough experiments. Sure. Enough. So does not science establish naturalism so firmly that that evidence overwhelms any evidence for any supposed miracle? What I would say to that person is that he should have come to my talk last night, <laughs> because that was exactly the issue that I addressed last night is the material world all there is, and I identified that as being an expression of this philosophy called naturalism. And you're quite right. If you are a determined naturalist, then that is a philosophical presupposition that will not allow events like the virgin birth, the miracles of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus to even be possibly historical. They go out the window before you even sit down at the table to look at the evidence. So in that case, your skepticism is not based upon historical considerations. It's not that the Gospels are historically or literarily deficient in some way. It's that you have a philosophical presupposition which precludes your believing them to be reliable. And in that case, I think one does need to go back to 
arguing philosophy. I, I would need to take off my New Testament scholar's hat and put on my philosopher's hat and argue that there are good grounds for thinking that the material universe is not all there is, that in fact there are good grounds for thinking that, there, that we should be open to a transcendent reality beyond the universe. So I would say to the naturalist, unless you have some sort of an argument for the non-existence of God, you have to be at least open to the possibility of miracles. Because if the existence of God is even possible, then it's possible that he has acted in history. And therefore, only the person who has a proof of atheism can be justified in presuming that miracles are impossible and that therefore these narratives are unreliable. And I think that would be a huge burden of proof for someone fair. Yes. Yeah, you um, list the uh, Gospels of Thomas and Philip under the Apocryphal Gospels. Yes. And I was just wondering if they were secondary accounts at best, what was the motivation behind writing those if they weren't written by the primary authors? Right. The motivation seems to have been Gnosticism. These uh, Apocryphal Gospels are shot through with Gnostic philosophy. Now, what is Gnosticism? Well, Gnosticism was a pagan belief system which believed that the material world is evil and the spiritual world is good. And that we are in bondage to the material world and the uh, things that dampen or eclipse the spirit in our lives. And that therefore the goal is enlightenment, to be freed of the constraints of the material and the bodily and to be spiritually enlightened so as to know secret knowledge and come to know our spiritual unity with God. Now this pagan philosophy of Gnosticism in the centuries after Christ began to piggyback upon uh, the, the, the Christian movement which was uh, beginning to, to grow. And it wrote these Gospels using Jesus as a kind of mouthpiece for Gnostic theology. They, they put Gnostic doctrines into the mouth of Jesus. It's very similar to New Age cults today, which like Scientology or uh, even Christian science or Jehovah's Witnesses, which are, are using Jesus or Christianity to espouse their own doctrines which are fundamentally at odds with Christianity. And so Gnosticism was, in a sense, a kind of early New Age cult, Christian cult, that had its own literature like these apocryphal gospels. And this is evident from the vocabulary and the theology of these writings that these do come out of this Gnostic movement. So that would be the motivation behind having these um, gospels. It's an attempt to piggyback on the success of the Christian movement as a kind of Christian cult, if you will. Uh-huh. Hi. Uh, I just have a question about uh, writing in the Gospels um, that perhaps would have happened behind closed doors without eyewitnesses or different yeah. dialogue, Jesus praying by himself, that kind of thing, and what, how that uh, came to be in yeah. the Gospels. Again, I am not defending the historical reliability of any of those sorts of passages because it's not germane to the case that I'm giving. But I've always rather been puzzled by scholars who say, how could the disciples know what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? They were asleep. Because it says that Jesus went three times to pray, and this took place over a number of hours, and all that it says in the Gospels that he said was something like, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. But if not, then not my, but thy will be done. Well, that single sentence summarizes probably about you know, several hours of prayer, most of which they probably didn't hear. But before they fell asleep, I think they would have a good idea that that's what Jesus was, was praying about in the garden. So that... Uh, that just doesn't strike me as a very formidable sort of objection. I'm not sure what other cases you're thinking of where he would be. When briefly thinking about it, um, dialogue um, for between Pilate and Claudia, maybe um, about yes. the trial and everything. 
Yeah, now that's a, that's a, that would be, I think, a better example where one might imagine that this is an imaginative Christian reconstruction of what they think took place between Jesus and, and Pilate. Although, you know, I, uh, I saw a very interesting article by N.T. Wright, the British New Testament scholar, uh, or, or perhaps it was, it might have been R.T. France, who was also a British scholar, who, who spent time in Uganda and uh, pointed out that he said there were secret goings on, secret interrogations by Idi Amin's secret police and so forth of people. And he said it was stunning how quickly this information was leaked to the street and began to be rumored in the streets of, of Kampala. And that people knew all about this, even though it was all going on supposedly behind closed doors. So it's not really a great stretch of the imagination to imagine that Roman guards, you know, hearing what Pilate said in interrogating Jesus or, or things of that sort, that this would begin to circulate and eventually get out into the street. Uh, the, the example of what went on with Idi Amin and, uh, and, and uh, Uganda suggests that that could very well be possible. So I don't know, but if it is an imaginative reconstruction of what Christians supposed probably took place between Jesus and Pilate, it's, it's just not germane to the, the case that I'm presenting here tonight. You said that uh, skeptics and believers alike uh, historically believe that miracles to have undisputedly occurred. Uh, what, what evidence is there of that? Well, one would be multiple attestation. One of the most significant criteria that historians use for historical uh, facts would be multiple independent early witnesses to the same event. And what you have in the Gospels is precisely this kind of multiple independent attestation to these miracles. You not only have them in the Gospels, you have them also in Josephus, who refers to Jesus as a wonder worker and teacher. So Jesus evidently had some repute as a miracle worker and, and an exorcist. Now, what the critic will say is that he, he, these were just psychosomatic or, or imaginary or something of that sort. But the contemporary biblical critic doesn't deny that the historical Jesus was a, what we might call a faith healer and an exorcist. He, he went about casting out demons and healing people, doing miracles. And the only question is, do you think these were, were real or were they just sort of psychosomatic? Dr. Craig, uh, you said, and of course I completely agree, that Luke, or the author of Luke Acts, is completely historically reliable. But again, devil's advocate, mm -hmm. what scholars often say is that at least in one historical uh, aspect, he seems to be inaccurate. And that is the, the birth narrative, where I don't recall exactly, but I believe Quirinius is supposed to be the district ruler of Asia. Yeah. Caesar gave an order to that a census be taken, and and uh, supposedly the the reign of Herod does not overlap with the proper. You know what I'm talking about. I do. Could you respond to that, please? Yeah, this is a, one of the problems that remains in in Luke. It, it's sort of the the fly speck on the canvas that I think illustrates his general reliability. And the reason it's such a problem is because Luke is so generally reliable. It seems odd that he would identify Quirinius as being the governor of Syria during the time that Jesus was born, when the evidence seems to indicate that Quirinius was governor of Syria sometime later. Now, he doesn't actually use the word governor with respect to, um, to uh, Quirinius with respect to being over Syria. And it, he, he, um, he uses a word which indicates that he was uh, the ruling authority, but it's not the proper title governor. And it's perhaps possible that Quirinius was uh, the sort of appointed military official over Syria uh, at that time, and then later became officially the governor uh, in the proper sense of that word, but that he was operating as some sort of a, a Roman military official that was in charge of Syrian affairs. That's a possibility uh, and might be what Luke is referring to. It's interesting that in the book of Acts, Luke does refer to the second census that was taken under 
which was taken under Quirinius. So it's not as though Luke has confused these two censuses, thinking that the census under Quirinius really took place earlier and he got them mixed up because he refers to the second census that was taken later under Quirinius's governorship. So he's aware that there was the second census, and yet he says there was an earlier one that was taken when Quirinius was the ruler over Syria. And I think at this point we simply don't know how to reconcile that with the evidence. There are possibilities such as the one I suggested. Or again, I mean, for our purposes this evening, one could just say, yeah, Luke got it wrong. I mean, he made a mistake in this detail. He misplaced the reign of Quirinius. And again, that wouldn't affect anything that I'm talking about with respect to the case I'm making this evening. Yes? I was just wondering if what we know about the sources that Mark used when he was writing his recount of the crucifixion, I was wondering if we knew anything about those sources or where they came from, besides being eyewitness testimony. Do we know anything besides that? No, not really, because we have no documents of this passion source. It's very interesting when you read the Gospel of Mark, the story of Jesus' life consists of little anecdotes that are strung together, rather like pearls on a necklace, if you will, little separate anecdotes about the life of Jesus. And these may be arranged thematically rather than chronologically. But when you come to the last week of Jesus' life, suddenly it switches and you don't have these anecdotal pearl-like nuggets. Instead, you have one continuous long narrative from Jesus going up to Jerusalem, through his crucifixion, his burial, and then the discovery of the empty tomb. That seems to be the end of the passion narrative. And as you say, this is probably based upon eyewitness testimony that Mark himself received and then incorporates into his Gospel. But how old it is for sure, one can only guess. As I say, Rudolf Pesch dates it prior to AD 37. James Crossley also assigns it an extraordinarily early date. In the empty tomb narrative, there are certain traces of Aramaic in it, the original language spoken by Jesus and the disciples, which again suggests this is very early. But beyond that, it's really speculative. But it is important, just in general, to see the importance of these sources behind the Gospels, because that closes that window between the events and the date of the evidence even more narrowly. You get back to within seven years, even within five years of the crucifixion, and then the window of opportunity for legend to accrue and wipe out the historical core or the historical memory of Jesus just becomes so narrow as to become absurd. Legends typically take centuries to accrue, as in, for example, the story of Robin Hood or other sorts of legends that have accrued over the centuries so that the original historical figures have been lost. Yes? That's actually our time for questions. Oh, okay. So, all right. Well, thank you very much then. I've enjoyed being with you, and I hope that... For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at www.veritas.org.